Okay, so now let's deal with products of convergence sequences. So the goal here is to show that if Sn and Tn are convergent sequences, then Sn times Tn is another convergent sequence which converges to the product of the two limits, right? Um, so I'm just going to state the theorem. This is uh, 9.4. Um, if Sn converges to S, Tn converges to T, then Sn, Tn converges to St, right? Now, um, the question is, so before we were looking at sums, right? We were adding two convergent sequences and we were kind of asking the question, like if we know something about the error between Sn and S, and the error between Tn and T, what do we know about the error between Sn plus Tn and S plus T, right? And so we kind of want to ask a similar question, right? Uh, if, like, basically, what is the error Sn Tn minus St in terms of Sn minus S, this error, and Tn minus T, right? If you think about it as sort of errors or little deltas or something, right? Little changes. Uh, we want to understand the change in the product in terms of these individual changes. And if you think a little bit about that, actually, and if you think about what you know from calculus, um, you might have an instinct that there's sort of a product rule here, right? Which is like, you can imagine Sn is obtained by taking S and, um, you know, just tweaking it a little bit, right? Just adjusting the value of S just a little bit. If you imagine Sn that way, and Tn is like taking T and tweaking the value a little bit, right? At least when you make N really, really big, that should be the case because they converge, right? So these are just a little bit off from S and T. And if you think about what happens when you make small changes, right, you think about the derivative, right? So the, if you think about the derivative of the product of these two things, right, it's, it's the first one times the derivative or the change in the second one plus the second one times the derivative or change in the first one, right? So that's actually kind of what you get. So intuitively, I'm gonna say intuitively, we expect, and I'm just going to write something very imprecise here, okay? We want Sn, or we expect Sn Tn minus St to be, you know, related. So I'm going to just use this tilde to be like, you know, approximately or somehow related to um, basically, you know, let's say Sn and then there's like Tn minus T plus Tn, and then there's, um, you know, um, S, uh, a Sn minus S, right? So this, there's kind of, this is kind of um, a relationship that we might expect. And if you just sort of imagine, you know, looking at this expression, uh, or looking at this overall expression and seeing what you'd get, like, if you were to, you know, combine these things together or something, then you'll see you'd get something kind of similar to what we have over here, right? What would we get? We would get something like, uh, you know, and I'm going to combine the absolute values too, which might seem not very uh, kosher, but just bear with me. So if we just sort of pretend the absolute values almost don't even exist, then we would get something like um, Sn, uh, so you'd have Sn Tn minus Sn T plus Sn Tn again, uh, and then minus Stn, right? So what's the issue here? Okay, first of all, St, we have a minus Stn or minus Snt. Those, one of those two things could be considered to resemble this term over here um, if we were to change it to a T instead, right? And then this one, Sntn, like we might want two of these to cancel out with each other basically, right? So um, 
it turns out that the, the, the correct way to do this is basically to introduce the term, what the book does is they introduce the term SNT instead of SNTN, uh, they do, so they have SNT and then they make this be SNT and then they make this be ST. So I'll show you in the proof. So this is kind of a, you know, very informal, but it's supposed to motivate the trick that they use. So here's the proof. Um, well, actually, we'll still be doing some scratch work. So, so let me do this. So if we rewrite, in fact, I'm going to go back over, I'm going to actually erase, um, I'm going to erase this stuff. Okay. And I'll just write the correct, the sort of the precise correct way to phrase this now. Okay. So, um, we can rewrite, um, SNTN minus ST to be SNTN minus SNT plus SNT minus ST. Okay. So it's kind of similar to what I had before, but a couple N's vanished. I think this used to be an N here and then there was an N here, but now it's just T instead of um, TN. Okay. And then by the triangle inequality, so by the triangle inequality, this is less than or equal to um, SN. So I'll split it up, you know, here. It's sort of with the first two terms and the second two terms. So, and then I'll factor out SN from the first two. So we'll have SN TN minus T plus and then now we'll factor out T from the second two terms. So T, and then we'll have an SN minus S. Okay. Now this is pretty nice because we see these at TN minus T. That's good. That's something that we have control over and SN minus S. That's also something we have control over. So we just have to sort of imagine, like think about how we can control SN and T themselves. Right. And the key here is just to remember, well, T is a constant, so that's not too bad. SN is not a constant, but it approaches a constant. So by, like, so it should sort of be bounded above in some sense, right? And if you think about it, actually, that's what 9.1 tells us is that um, SN is bounded above by some constant. So basically we can kind of imagine it as being constant here, even though it isn't really constant, right? So in the end, what we can do is by making these two quantities small enough, TN minus T and SN minus S, um, so by making T n minus T and S n minus S small, this can be, we can individually make each of these terms less than epsilon over two. And we can make this one be less than epsilon over two. Okay. So by do, to, so to do that, what we can first do is take an upper bound on S n and then make TN minus T be less than epsilon over two times that upper bound, right? And then similarly, over here, we can make SN minus S be less than epsilon over two, you know, and then something bigger than the absolute value of T. You'll see in a sec, there's a technicality here that we have to use, but you'll see. So now I'll actually do the proof. Um, so, uh, so, okay, first of all, let epsilon be greater than zero. Uh, now by 9.1, remember theorem 9.1, which was about the boundedness that says that sequ conversion sequences are bounded. There exists an M greater than zero such that um, SN is less than M for all N. Okay, so there's that. Now take epsilon uh, epsilon or so, okay. Now, because SN converges, we can take N one, uh, such that, um, the absolute value of SN minus S is less than the, is less than, or sorry, not epsilon. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you'll see in a sec. So, epsilon, the given epsilon over here, sorry, I'm kind of stuttering a bit, um, over two times absolute value of t plus one. 
Now this is to deal with the second term over here, okay? So basically by making um, Sn minus S be less than this, right? That forces this term to be less than epsilon over two uh, because we have this epsilon over two. And then there's this thing over here, which is bigger than the absolute value of T, right? So when we multiply by absolute value of T, we'll still have something less than epsilon over two. Now you might be wondering why the plus one, why not just absolute value of T here so they cancel out? The reason we have to do that is just because it's actually possible that absolute value of t could be zero. Um, so then this expression would just become undefined. So that's kind of uh, an annoying just technicality we have to deal with. We could add any positive number here and it wouldn't affect the validity of the result. Um, we just add one because that's a simple way of dealing with this. So that's just a technicality. So this is a technicality. Okay. Um, then uh, we can pick n2 such that tn minus t, now we wanna deal with this term. We make tn minus t be really small. Uh, and we can make it be smaller than epsilon over 2m, right? And m was taken bigger than zero, so that's not a problem, okay? So now we have these two things. So then by this scratch work, so this is kind of scratch. Um, so by the scratch, we have Sn Tn minus St is less than or equal to Sn Tn minus T plus T Sn minus S, which is now less than Sn times epsilon over 2m plus t times epsilon over 2 absolute value of t plus 1, which is still less than um, or less than or equal to at least. Uh, so we have, see, look, absolute value of Sn over m, that's less than 1 or less than or equal to 1. So this term is still less than or equal to epsilon over 2. And this, this term is less than or equal to epsilon over two because we have absolute value of t over absolute value of t plus one, which is also less than one. Okay, so that's epsilon. So there you have it. That's actually the whole proof. It got a little cramped down here. But uh, yeah, so this trick here of doing this, introducing this term SNT might seem a little bit weird. It's kind of, it's pretty slick, okay? Um, so it's nice, but it's a little bit not obvious uh, where that comes from. I tried my best to motivate it, but um, yeah, it might still seem a little bit magical. I actually might post another video, which is outside of the sort of required lectures, um, but I might post another video explaining a different proof of this theorem that I um, have that uh, might be a little bit more intuitive. So that it does it avoids doing weird tricks like this, but it's also a little more complicated. Um, so anyway, but in the next video, We'll talk about quotients.